Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the Crew First Culture podcast. Very excited to be back with you today. Thank you for spending some time with us today. I've got Chief Andy Starnes on with me. How are you doing, Chief? I'm better than I deserve, sir. Thank you for having us. That's, that's right. I'm very, very glad to have you on. Uh, I want to get into it. So before we do that, definitely let you take a, a little bit to introduce yourself. Like I tell my guests, you give as much or as little introduction as you can and backstory and, and whatever, and, and we'll go from there. No, well, I appreciate the opportunity first. And uh, you and I had briefly chatted on a uh, mutual friend, Ryan Pennington's clubhouse thing. I'm new to that whole thing. Yeah. I don't understand it. So you got to <laughs> bear with me as I was figuring that out. <laughs> um, I'm from, uh, I live in Shelby, North Carolina with my wife and daughter, Sarah and Emma. We've lived here now uh, going on 15, 16 years. Uh, I've been, that's my first priority is my, my faith and my family. And then I work for the fire department. I work for a large metropolitan department in North Carolina where I serve as a battalion chief. I've been there 23 years. Um, prior to that, I've been chasing my dad around in the volunteer fire services where I got my start. Since I was eight years old, I would go ride in the car to spend time with him and wait tables at fish fries and barbecues and and then became a junior firefighter when I was 16. So uh, be 30 years this year, be 46 years old. So I'm feeling that more days than, than not. <laughs> Uh, but uh, not quite as busy as you, my friend. Um, but I have one one little one to chase around who's 11 and showing her personality every day. Uh, my goal in taking care of myself is that not only can I do my job, but I can come home and have energy for her because uh, that's that's a big thing because she's always ready to go. Oh, yeah. uh, but I love the fire service, but I learned through hardships several years ago that the fire service can be a spiritual detriment it can be an opportunity. And that's where, when I told you about having this conversation, you know, I'm big into thermal imaging. That's, that's my thing, yep. but that's not what defines me. My, yep. my, my biggest thing is helping firefighters. You get in the door as a good instructor because of your credentials as a firefighter. They want to know that you can do the job, but that's when they'll listen to you about other topics like family, marriage and divorce, kids. They're not going to listen to you if you're not good on the fire ground. And that's yeah. just, that's kind of like your business card, if you will. Um, so in my opinion, you know, being able to instruct and teach is a blessing, but the biggest blessing I get is the dinners and conversations I have with firefighters after the fact that were suicidal, uh, or that were struggling with their marriage, that were dealing with PTSD, or just like what you talked about on Ryan's thing, hard times in the fire service. And they just needed an encouraging voice to know that they weren't the only ones struggling with all the same problems we all struggle with. So, uh, but I'm blessed to participate in a lot of things and rather go down all those rabbit holes. I would rather talk about the main things we came to talk about today and, and hear more about how we can, like we talked about with Ryan, encourage others who may be in those same spots and light a fire underneath them because we all need that, right? It's just like this cup of coffee. Uh, it's required in my house. My marriage cannot sustain me giving up coffee. <laughs> Got to have it to get fired up. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. Is, is that all? I know you had to take a drink there, but I didn't I'm want to good. cut you off. You good. Good. Okay. Yeah, you I, <laughs> I, I appreciate what you said right there. You know, you, you are known if, if you want to use that, that term, if you're, you're known for thermal imaging, you know, that, that is your wheelhouse, I'll say, mm -hmm. but that's not why I, I am so excited to talk with you. I am excited to talk with you about the other stuff that you just mentioned. And, and I'll bring up, I'll bring up this, and, and this is the most exciting part of, of this hobby, I will say, of mine, to get to talk to people like you is, is two of the most impactful podcasts I've had, conversations I've had, is with Rick George and Frank Vescuso, two unbelievable people. But what was so impactful about those conversations was Rick George is known for his firefighter resiliency and all that good stuff and training. Frank Viscuso is a leadership guy, you know, all that stuff. But I truly dug into and was inspired by Frank's conversation about family, about being a better dad and, and things like that. And it made me want to be a better dad. Uh, Rick George his conversation was about his story, which is a freaking amazing story to go from what he was to what he is. Mm -hmm. And that was so inspiring. So 
you know, two guys very well known in the fire service for certain things, Mm -hmm. but were the most impactful conversations I've had for totally different discussions. And that's what I love. I love getting a chief Andy Starnes on here and people expect you to start talking about, you know, thermal imaging and layers and, and bridging and all that. And, and no, we're going to talk about some faith and we're going to talk about some family and, and passion and struggles and all that. And that is exciting for me. So I'm very appreciative for you to come on and be willing to do that with me. No, I appreciate that. But I, I had said this to my wife last night. I'll try not to get too emotional saying it because we're dealing with some <laughs> uh, interesting conversations with my daughter. And um, yeah, I, as much as I think that I was put here on this earth to do things that are skilled with our hands. No, yeah. it's all about the heart skills. And yeah. I, I love doing things with my hands, but I'm not, I'm not a craftsman, if you will. Um, my, my purpose, if, if I'm correct, and I've been wrong about a lot of things, <laughs> is to be there for people and show them that they're not alone and try to ask the right questions to guide them back to where they need to be so they can see the answer to their own problems and where that comes from and realize, Hey, like you said, look at Frank, look at Rick, two very highly respected people. And that's usually all people see, but they don't realize that most of these people, if you study leadership, they struggle with depression, anxiety. They had high divorce rates. They had conflicts at home. They suffered tremendously but all you see is these fancy inspirational leadership quotes you know and I, I call them the leadership quote guys they they charge lots of money to come in and just give you lots of quotes and inspirational stuff but they don't tell you how to actually fight the actual fires within your fire station that when yes. you come to work after having rough two, four days at home with your family dealing with some difficult things and one of your co-workers who's your dear friend decides to do something stupid and you have to discipline them for it. Where's your leadership quote for that? What do you, how are you going to handle that when you got to be the boss? You're going to shirk that responsibility when they've come in and assaulted somebody, or are you going to shirk that when they come in high or intoxicated and got in a fire truck? You, you can't, you have to deal with it. It's like being a parent and having to discipline your child. You don't want to, but you have to. Yeah. And no disrespect to anyone teaching leadership because it's highly needed. But I'm writing something called the other side of leadership. And that's what's not talked about is the tough parts and how you survive that, how you endure that and how you come out on the other side of that. And you don't destroy other people or your marriage, your family or yourself because the world is constantly hitting us with conflict. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to absorb the conflict and the negativity and turn around and dump it on your family? Because that's what I did. And I had to go to counseling to see a pastor or a doctor and a clinician 14 years ago. You know, I take a pill every day. It's called a stay married pill. Search your lean. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I take a testosterone shot every 10 days. So I don't go through male menopause. According to my doctor, <laughs> I sleep with a CPAP machine. I work out four days a week, four to five times a week. I get, you know, we all have to deal with stuff. Yeah. But does that mean you got to go around and be bitter and, and cynical or does that mean you got to go around and everything's great and when it's not great no you have to be a balanced like what you want to talk about a balanced individual who's able to share realistic things and how things are going to be hard but you're going to get through them together just like you with your family y'all get through things together man i bet you don't manage the entire 10 acres and all them animals you have by yourself every single day you have help imagine you do a lot of it but it's like our chickens. I got them for my daughter to take care of. I have yet to see her out there scooping chicken poop, but (laughs) (laughs) you know, we, we all have to do things together. And the biggest thing I want to to hammer as we go through this is how as firefighters, we will do everything on the fire ground together, pulling lines, cutting holes, doing CPR, everything we do, we do as a team. But when me, you, Jeremy, or anybody else we know has some major personal problem, we isolate, we won't talk about it, yep. and then we'll judge that firefighter when they come to work and start acting differently. We'll call them sorry, we'll call them slack, we'll do whatever yep. until we realize, hey, did you see her so-and-so got a divorce or so-and-so committed suicide or so-and-so? Yep. 
like you didn't see that coming. I mean, if you and I will go into a burning building for somebody we don't even know or possibly don't even like and sacrifice our life, why won't we take the time to sit down and have a cup of coffee, sit down, shut up, listen, and lift up? Because we don't have to be a licensed counselor to do that. If you've been a parent, you understand how to sit down and listen, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my point is, is why don't we as firefighters take those same concepts, those same skills, and apply them to our lives and our families and realize that you are equipped to handle those situations. Yeah. It just takes a different type of courage and vulnerability that not many feel comfortable doing. And they always, Aaron Field says, comfort is the enemy of growth. Well, where's your comfort when you have to sit down and talk and have that hard conversation? Because I know people who will take a two and a half into a house fire by themselves, but they won't sit down and talk to somebody who's struggling. And that is a direct contradiction of what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to be the same person inside and out, skills and personal personnel things and, and principles. That's what we need to work on. That's where I push is be that firefighter, be that father, be that husband, wife, mother all the time. And as you know, that's hard. And, you know, there's no Duracell Energizer bunny battery that you just change every morning. You know, we, we have to refill our cups. And so how do we do that, Jeremy? Is, I think you and I discussed this with Ryan. How do we keep that cup full for 25, 30 years? Yeah. And then realize when you come home, that your goal is not to come home to your kids out of the house and your wife look at you and go, I don't know you anymore. Let's get a divorce. Is that how we should end our glorious 30 year career of sacrificial service to the public? to live in a shoebox and drink liquor every day and realize that I lost my family in the process. No. Yeah. That's, no. that's for sure. Now, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I heard you mention the, the other side of leadership that the project you're working on, on a uh, firefighter success podcast with, uh, with Moss. Yes, and I, I I'm honestly kind of going through something similar and, you know, trying to do this underground leadership movement thing. And, and from what, how you describe what you're talking about, that's, that's the, the uh, trying to think of the word, that's kind of the, the push for me as well. It's, it's those, those things that we need to know as a leader that nobody ever teaches you. Oh, you know, okay. We'll go through a size up class or a tactics class or a fire, you know, all this crap, but Oh, how do you how do you know how to go to a new station that has a terrible culture mm -hmm. and start from the ground up and create a new culture? Because I guarantee you, nobody ever told me anything about that. <laughs> or you know what you what you said, you know, dealing with some serious crap because mm -hmm. that is the hardest part about being a a formal leader in the fire service. Agreed. It's not it's not bringing people through the front door to fire. Shoot, that's what we live for. That's the easy part. Like uh, Chief Hovelman said, you know, it doesn't take any bravery to to go fight fire. We love that. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. The bravery is is making the choices that nobody likes you to make, but you have to make them because of the right thing to do. Amen. And gosh dang, that we need that. We need that so much. We need to be taught how to be leaders. And I just, it's just such a huge hole right now for us. And I, I really want to do my part, like exactly what you're saying. You're doing, working on to do your part too, to help that. And I think what you said is spot on because we're a thousand miles wide and three inches deep in our service delivery model. We have to be experts at all these different things. And, and whether we like to admit it or not, we can't be experts at every every concept, every task, yeah. we have to have a, a, some type of matrix or a matrix where they grade us and say, yeah, that's good enough according to the state. And we know that's not good enough. There is no such thing as good enough. But when it comes to the real success, like Jim Moss talks about, he says that, you know, when lives are at stake, success is our only option. Well, what lives are at stake inside of your four walls of your house? Yeah. At your home. What lives are at stake when you work report to work? If you're serving as a captain and you have three to four firefighters under you, those are yours. And if you like, in my case, I have 20 
five people under my supervision every day that I go to work. I'm responsible for their mental, physical, emotional well-being, whether I like it or not. And in some days with that hard culture or that, you know, one person that doesn't seem to get it or that one person that doesn't care as much as I do, I have to find a balance to to address and adapt and talk to each person in a way that gets them to respond. Uh, Chief Billy Greenwood is really good at that and his teachings about learning how people work and learning how to talk to them. You know, you hear people talking about adapting your leadership style. Well, that may work in some cases, but if you don't know how to talk to people and more importantly, you don't know how to listen to people and size them up and realize what is it they need to empower them and for them to be successful. Not, not me. I could care less about me. I want to get them to run the station in a way that it takes care of their people. Right. You said it best. If you told me right now, there's a house fire two blocks down the street and you get to be on the nozzle. If you go right now, I'm gone. Right. (laughs) They don't let me touch the nozzle. Right. (laughs) So I'm gone. That's fun. I'm going, but you tell me that there's two, two doors down there. There's a family struggling and the husband's about to leave his wife and you're the only person qualified to go talk to him. How many excuses are we going to come up with? Yeah. And yeah. let me ask you this, Jeremy, in, in, in your, your experience in the fire service, and this would be a good back and forth conversation. How many problems do you think we deal with in the fire department in general, whether it's disciplinary or whatever, because a failure in leadership, not in the way they lead, but in the way they don't lead when they don't deal with things, when they, when they ignore things, they say, that's just so-and-so's way, or they say, that's your problem. Or, you know, I have high ranking officials call me at midnight saying, I got a firefighter who's got a gun in his hand and he's wanting to hurt himself. I, I told him to call EAP. I didn't know what to do. Do you honestly think that that's true leadership yeah. or is that a cop out? Yeah. You mean, you mean you can't, just listen to them. Well, I, I don't understand that. I, that whole de- depression and PTSD. I don't think that stuff's real. Well, just because it hadn't happened to you yet doesn't mean it's not real. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say there's too many people I know, including myself, that I used to make fun of people who had panic attacks until shortly after my first promotion, I used to go home and have a panic attack three to four times a week. Yeah. And I felt like an elephant crushing me where I couldn't breathe. Now, if you want to know the difference between sympathy and empathy, empathy is you've been in their shoes. And I think some of these leaders who preach, oh, you got to be experienced. Okay. Experience on the fire ground. I'm, I'm all about it. But where's yeah. your experience in dealing with this? Life like, experience. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they don't, they don't want to deal with it. Yep. They pawn it off. Oh, oh call so-and-so or, or yeah. Yeah. Just, just give them a couple of days off, put them in a cubicle, let them, let them get some light duty. They'll feel better. That's not helping. That's hiding. That's isolating and transferring or moving around. That doesn't fix yeah. anybody. Absolutely. You know, if you're shoving your kid in your room for timeout, they may give them a little bit and think about it, but you want to put them on timeout for 10, 20 years? Because <laughs> that's what the fire department does. <laughs> Push them in the corner. So help me out. How many, how many do you think really the problems we face could be addressed if we just started doing our job inside the four walls of the station and and facing those fires within those four walls, not the fires on the street, but yep. the fires inside our personnel's lives. And I, I would be very comfortable saying a vast, vast majority. Uh, and I would be slightly comfortable say almost everywhere, all of them, mm-hmm. because that's exactly what I see too. Everything you just said, you know, I'm sitting here kind of giggling to myself because that's how we deal with problems. We, we have personal issues. And it's just shoved off on that officer to deal with it. They deal with it or they don't, you know, who knows. And, and then the officer has enough and, and he sends them out and, and the problem is moved and, and that's it. Nothing is ever addressed. And, and to, to speak on that, and this is a personal lesson that I have, have went through here very recently, you know, I have dealt with the situation with somebody that I, I tried and tried and tried to reach them. I tried and tried and tried to change their thinking, their attitude, their just, just try to do something, make a difference. And I, and I couldn't do it. 
Mm -hmm. years into this. I poured, I feel like I can comfortably say I poured myself into this person. I put more time and energy into that person than anybody else in my crew. And it, it, nothing was, nothing changes, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. And it was starting to eat at me. I, I couldn't do it anymore. And so I made some, I requested to make some changes. And when that day came that it happened, I set him down and I talked to him about it. I didn't, and, and this, this took a lot. I am a conflict avoiding type person that when I, before I became an officer, I knew that was going to be my biggest weakness to overcome. Okay. And so, <laughs> so I had to talk myself up because you know, he deserves the respect to hear the truth because hopefully maybe it will help him to click something in place and change over, you know, in time. But I told him, you know, this is, this was my choice. I asked for this. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I can't help you anymore. I've taken you as far as I can take you. I don't think I can do any more good for you. It's time for somebody else to take that seat that I can help. And that was the hardest day, I, I would say, of my 19-year career, because that was not a comfortable situation to be in. And he didn't take it well, because he loved being there. And, you know, to be honest, I, I loved having him there. But the negatives were, were so high that I, I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, just, it, it was almost like I had to do that to test myself to test the things I'm sitting here on this podcast and on social media speaking of, mm -hmm. I felt like if I'm going to do that, then that is a conversation I better have because that's exactly what I'm preaching. You've got to be honest. you got to deal with the problems head on. Mm -hmm. And so, man, it, it was hard, but I, I did it. I, I can say I did it. I can say that I didn't just lie and pass it on. And so, you know, it, it was good to go through that. And I'm, I'm glad you shared that because let me ask you this. How long did you struggle with that before you actually had that? A, a long time, a, right. a long time. So, you know, it, it was literally years that I was with them uh, and it was up and down, you know, there would, there would be strives of, of changing, mm -hmm. but the, the negativity was the biggest thing. Just, I mean, it's just somebody that feeds on negativity and, and I can't do that. But I would say the last, the last six months before the change happened, was bad. I mean, it was, I'm an officer who is out with my, my people. Yes, so I, I stay up till 11, 12 o'clock at night doing office stuff because I, I don't do it during the day when most people do, because I want to spend that time with them and, and build that relationship. But at those, those times, or at that time, I was in my office all the time and, and everybody else knew mm -hmm. that it was hard. For me and so yeah it, it was it was a pretty good stretch so when you handle it though how did you feel afterwards though uh did you feel like a that, weight lifted off of you when you found uh, it was it was very mixed I, I felt like yes there was some weight lifted but just judging from the reaction i got i didn't know that it really did any good i didn't know that or i couldn't tell that it was appreciated. You know what I mean? It, it's a hard conversation to have. So he's obviously not going to be like, Oh yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Mm. And, and so, you know, it, it was hard to sit there and look at how the reaction was and be like, Nope. Was this worth, was it really worth, it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it would have been better just to say, Hey, they want some experience over here. They're, you're going to move over there for that what, and be what's... done with it. Let's take your problem and break it down so everybody can learn something from it. Cause yeah. I have similar, we all have similar issues. So we have a, a hypothetical problem within our four walls that we're dealing with, but we're not really dealing with effectively. And we try different things, but it continues to worsen. And the longer it continues to worsen, it's poisoning the station and whatnot. And I had a firefighter taught me this very same lesson that for three years, I let him and I deal with it that way. And now because of him, I have a 12 month rule. You come in, you start behaving that way. It immediately gives me a red flag. 
I set you on a progressive discipline plan. We talk about goals and understanding. It's not punishment. It's, it's a pathway. And at the end of the 12 months, if I don't see marked progress on both sides, not just his or hers, mine too, and in the station, then that person gets to go somewhere else because as Chip Ingram taught me, who's a well-known pastor who counsels people, he says, after a year of talking to somebody, if I keep sharing the same information, yeah. providing resources, and I don't see growth, and I don't see change, then they don't want to change, not at least with me. So I take them to a public place and I slide a, a business card across the desk and said, this person charges 150 to $200 an hour. You've exceeded my abilities. As my dad says, your inability to do your job is outperform my ability to protect you. Um, so I cannot save everybody. My wife taught me this lesson. You're, we're not God. Okay. And we're not going to be able to supervise everyone effectively. We're not going to be able to fix everyone effectively. And if you probably had this happen too, where you've had a friend who you're really good friends with, but then you can't work together. Right. So let's, let's tie some analogies in here where we can all think about this. When as a married couple, when your wife brings you a problem, does she want you to fix it or does she want you to listen? Which one is it? Probably listen. Okay. <laughs> Took me 16 years to figure that out because yeah. we're wired to fix things. We're firefighters. We're men. We want to fix things. Firefighters in general are fixers. So it's very difficult for us when we can't fix something. Yeah. Well, here's one you can't fix. I got two for you. I worked with a gentleman for over five years. And probably one of the best firefighters I've met, bright young man, everybody loved him, did everything he would ask you to do. Everybody wanted him on his or wanted him on their truck. He worked all the time. He was in the military. He was very dedicated and he started having some problems. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know about the problems until they were brought to my attention. It didn't even show up at first. And we tried to get him help, Jeremy, and he wouldn't get help. He would look you in the eye and say, yeah, I need to do that. I appreciate you bringing attention. Just like you said, I don't think it did any good. Yep. And he continued to worsen until uh, earlier this year. He turned on a road and drove head on into a tractor trailer. He would have made it to his 31st birthday in January. He's gone. Yep. I feel, and I'll tell you, to this day, I feel like I failed him. To this day. Did everything I thought I could do. Didn't. Didn't make a difference. In your words, you said, I don't think it made a difference. You're wrong. You did make a difference in you and your people. And sometimes that one person may need to go somewhere else because you can't grow in toxic soil, right? Yeah. And the person I tried to help, as good as gold as he was, he's got to want help, right? Oh, yeah. He's got he's to appreciate that help. He's got to be able to go... You know, you can put them on the nozzle, but you can't make them move. They've got to push themselves. Yeah. And that's the hard part is, is realizing that I invested 14 years in a particular individual who's one of my closest and dearest friends who just walked away from me. No reason, no explanation. I'm done with you. Gone. Doesn't even talk to me anymore. That hurts. Yeah. I, and what hurts worse for me and you as leaders is not knowing the answer, the uncertainty, oh, the yeah. could I have done more? Could I have made a difference? I'll never know until I get to heaven. I won't. Yeah. But I, what I can do is lay my head down at night knowing that you and I both gave everything we could, despite our own failings and flaws, to help that person and help the people in that environment. But to quote my mentor, Chief Lamb, he was dealing with a particular individual and He'd been in the office within three hours and somebody came in and said, Hey chief, just want you to know there's 42 other firefighters out here that need your help. All of his time and effort was being focused on that one firefighter. Yeah. But these other firefighters needed his attention too, but he couldn't give it to them because this one particular individual was consuming him. Yeah. So if you and I have a spot, a cancer on our arm, they don't just cut the cancer out. Do they, they cut a wide margin. The problem is sometimes you and I are in the margin and we either get cut out, we get damaged, we get hurt. How do you deal with that after that person's moved on and they end up doing great, great, good job. I hope they do. But that leaves you and I a couple of different things, a scar or a memory. And the next time we face that problem, I hope that we as leaders look at it and go, I'm going to address that a little differently because that, that cost me. 
You know, I had emotional investment in it. I said this this morning to a friend of mine, the definition of compassion means to suffer with. You know, when it, what was it your parents told you? It's going to hurt me just as much as it hurts you. You're like, no, now you're a dad. It does hurt. Yeah. It hurts emotion. It hurts your heart. I'd rather take a punch to the face than have to discipline or punish somebody I love. Yeah. But if you don't, if, if you love them, you will discipline them. Because if you don't, it's like that same cancer. You don't deal with it. What does it do? It grows. It gets worse. And it infects and hurts everybody around them. Yeah. And who are they going to blame in the end? You and me. Because yeah. we didn't deal with it. We didn't fight that fire inside of that those four walls. We did anything else outside of there. Jam up. Well, we. My favorite saying is, we can solve everybody else's problems, but not ours. No, 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 don't, don't talk about my problems. I can fix the world, three alarm fire, deliver, you know, breach baby. We do whatever. But a uh, personnel issue inside the station, uh, B shift has rearranged the furniture. C shift decided they're going to hang funny pictures on the wall. We can't deal with that. Yeah. So do we divorce it and shove them away like the fire department does? Because if we do that, what, what example are we setting for our kids? Hey, when you don't behave, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move you down the street to uh, your friend's house. But is that a good way of, you know, my kids aren't behaving, so I'm, I'm sending them somewhere else. Yeah. Is that what we should do every time we face a problem is move the problem away from us out of our sight? No, we should do exactly what you did. We should try everything we can. And then we get to that last, <laughs> last resort. I don't have any other option. But the point being is none of this is easy. None of it. You can quote me any leadership mantra or dialogue or doctrine you want until you have absolute faith in your heart, knowing that you are doing the best you can, the right things for that individual based on principles, not on ego, not on profit, not on uh, a driven nature to protect your own position, but you're legitimately trying to save them or save the other people around them. You're not going to survive. Yeah. You're not. Because there's a great book called Lead Like Jesus, and it'll give you a leadership size up in five minutes. Two types of people, driven or called. Driven, yank on their collar. Look at me. I'm the captain. I'm the chief. They do everything they can to protect their position. They, they intimidate. They don't do succession planning. They do leadership quotes all the time. But in, behind the closed door, they're going to do everything backwards. This two-faced individual, Right. Whereas a, a called leader is all about the message, not the messenger. My job, if you're my, my captain in my battalion, is to give you everything you need to make you better than I am, to give you power, to give you success, to help you. Help you. It, it's all about that, knowing that as soon as I leave my fire department, three months later, they'll go, Andy, who? You know, I'm gone. It's all about the person behind the badge. I'm trying to help them. So if you figure that out really quickly, Jeremy, when you're dealing with somebody, am I dealing with a driven person or called person? Because if they're driven and your your values and their values don't match up, good luck. Yep. They need to go to a higher level of care. When you and I take them from, from the car accident to the ambulance, they're going to a higher level of care. We're not ditching our responsibility. Do not think that. You didn't yep. fail. It's not that you didn't do any good. You did the right thing. You moved that person to a higher level of care or sometimes a higher level of accountability. Yeah. And, and that's tough, but I'm telling you this, people want that leadership job until it's time to make that decision. And then they oh, yeah. start ducking. Yeah. They're like the person in the front yard. I had my air packs not working while you're in there fighting the fire. They're doing that to you and me on the disciplinary, the tough decisions, the conflict resolution, every leader that ducks it is doing that. And they don't like to hear that because then it, it hits, it hits the for them mantra really hard because they're, they're willing to, like you said, I'll crawl down that hallway, but I'm not going to walk down that hallway and go talk to Joe about his problems. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think there's a lot of comparisons that we all can look at. Just like I talked about in my own life that we need to understand it is not about the, it's not always the glorious things when we cross the apron with the federal queue wide open it's it's the silence within the four walls because we're all dealing with something very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. That, 
And, and what's truly amazing is, is since that change has been made, just it's almost like a breath of fresh air now. I mean, I, it's, it's like a completely different place. Mm-hmm. And what, what is exciting about it is that's the place that I want. That's, that's what I have been working to achieve, the, the culture that I've been achieving. And, and it just took changing out one piece. And not that I've got, I'm at a five person station, me and four other guys. Every one of the other guys are testing for promotions here within the next month and a half. And so I literally can be sitting at that station with completely different people here in a couple months. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that it, we got it all figured out, but to be able to see that, wow, okay, now that I've got kind of a fresh start we actually are making a difference we actually are creating some some positive cultural special things here and and that's been really really good to to feel as a leader you know to go from feeling a, a pretty much like you're failing like you know like you talk about like you failed as a leader because you couldn't make a change in somebody to now seeing gosh, it's, it's a lot of freaking work. It's a lot of work and it is slow and it is going to require a lot of patience, but it will make a difference and, and it's worth it in the end to finally start seeing a little bit of that. That is, that is awesome. And you're, you're very uh, title here about culture, right? The thing I think we all need to think about is everybody wants to change their culture, but Culture, by definition, means a coherent or shared set of values. Yep. Values, as my father says, determine relationships. So, Jeremy, if the five people in your your station don't have the same set of values and are not interested in improving their values, what are we setting ourselves up for? Yep. Conflict. Now, if, if they're willing to change their uh, a rookie or someone who's went through something hard and they're willing to look to you and say, well, Jeremy went through something hard and he's able to come out on the other side, just like our skills can improve, so can our abilities to manage stressors, right? Yeah. But, but what they want to, what they're really going to look to is your skills made you a better firefighter when it talked about, you know, hose deployment or throwing ladders or all the different things. But what made you a better person? It's not your skill set per se in your hands, but in your heart, your values. So what are your values? What are my values? What are people going to look to and say, what makes Jeremy different as a captain than the other captain over here? Who's also very skilled, but interacts with people differently. Yeah. What is it that sets us apart that helps strengthen and build that culture that, that is a positive culture, not a, not a toxic culture. Uh, what do you think that is? Uh, f- for me, it's just, you know, values, living, having values, having a vision for, for what you want, what you want your environment to look like. And that's, that's something that's, that's big with me is, is that vision, because I feel like if you don't have that vision, it's just like, if you're shooting something and you don't have a target, you know, what, what are you really aiming for? You don't, you don't know. I mean, yeah, you could try hard to be a leader and, and all that. And, and that, this goes back to, you know, the, what we talked about earlier, that your, your project, the other side of leadership and, and mine, the underground leadership, it's just, those are the lessons that need to be told. It's, it's truly not overlooking the, the important things in life, you know, having, values that you leave. I, I like to call it the, you know, golden rule leadership, basically, you know, I, all these thousands and thousands of leadership books are out there and, and thousands and thousands of hours of podcasts and, and on and on and on about leadership, which again, like you said, I'm not downing any of it. I love mm-hmm. absorbing that information, Me too. but you could literally sum up every bit of it in a, one little sentence and that's lead people like you want to be led. Okay. You know, basically taking that golden rule and applying it to leadership. I think if you can do that, you're going to be in pretty good shape and then you can figure the rest out as you go. And I think that's wise, but we have to be careful whose golden rule it is. 
because uh, a certain person in his history said, man is the measure of all things, which man? If that, if that captain or chief feels fine with being treated like a pain in the butt and, and being yelled at, then he's going to lead them that way. Yeah. Whereas if you and I have a transcendent set of moral anchored values that are outside of ourselves, because here's the problem with leadership stuff in general. If it's their opinion on it and their doctrine, there's always going to be a revised edition. Have you ever noticed in college, there's always a revised edition of ethics? What do you mean? How did, how did ethics get better? How did we change truth? Yeah. What's relevant? What's absolute? The world doesn't like words like absolute. There are such things as absolute. We raise an entire generation to tell them the truth is relevant. And then when they graduate from college and they go and mess up Enron's uh, hedge funds, they go to prison and realize truth is not just relevant. There is an absolute truth in court and in other ways too. Yeah. So when you say the golden rule of leadership, I'm all for it. But the problem is, is this is where people don't want to talk about where we started in the beginning. What's your values are determined by what your faith and your principles. Some people have principles that waver with the wind or whatever social media tells them. And some people are grounded and I'm not going to tell you, you have to believe the way I do, but my faith is what is my moral compass. And when I get outside of that moral compass, it's not my faith that led me astray. It's this fleshful, lustful, problematic person here that has made a, made a decision that he shouldn't have made. So if I have a set of values that I should follow and I try to live my life by those values and those values never change, you have a consistent system, a consistent behavior of love, discipline, accountability, responsibility. You don't have Jekyll and Hyde leadership. Yeah. You don't have that, that bipolar leadership, if you will. Yeah. You don't. And that's, that's dangerous because you'll have a leader that acts one way Monday through Friday and different on Saturday and Sunday. Or as my wife told me, we've been married three years. And I told her I found out a friend of mine that was cheating on his wife and how it shocked me. She looked me straight in the face and said, all men do it. It's only a matter of time before you do it to me. And I said, what? She saw how I behaved at the fire station. And she said, you're trying to play good godly man at home, but I see how you act at work. And I believe the guy at work is going to win out. As James says, don't be the double-minded man. I was the double-minded man. You want to talk about a road to conviction? That's where it started for me. Yep. And we went on a little mini spiritual retreat and these people got up and shared their testimonies. These people were doctors, lawyers, politicians, high ranking officials in the community. And every single one of them shared some horrific thing in their past. Either they did, they went through and my mouth is just dropping open. Because everybody looks at these people like they're perfect and they've never made mistakes. And that is so far from the truth. So what's your values that keep you grounded so you don't look like something you're not? Because if somebody stands up, Jeremy, and it, whether it's behind a pulpit or at a conference or anywhere, and they preach something that they are not, and they preach something they don't do, it's only a matter of time before it's found out. And firefighters are the world's best next to convicts to see through BS. Oh, well, he says he does this. He don't do that. He says he works out, but look at his waistline. You know, I mean, I work out all the time. Look at his double chin. I'm fighting. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, my daughter loves pizza and I, I'm right there with her. But that, that whole thing comes from being grounded in transcendent moral values that you and I believe in that are outside of ourselves. And if we don't have that, Jeremy, what happens when next week the department decides they have a new mission, vision, value statement? Why did you revise it? Did it get better or did you throw out a particular value? Mm -hmm. That golden rule better be somebody else's golden rule that's a lot smarter and higher up than you and I. Yeah. Because if it's based on politics, power, greed, being politically correct, we'll never lead people the way they need to be led. We only lead people the way we're told that they need to be led. And there'll always be an exclusion clause. There'll always be an exception. No, they should be treated. Just like you said, they deserve that courtesy, that, that love and that respect to tell them the truth and do it in, in with gentleness and respect. Don't be ugly about it, 
But I think that comes from those values that are way higher than outside of ourselves. I mean, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts just like you. I don't listen to a lot of fire service podcasts. I listen to a lot of different ones. And I listen to a lot of faith-based ones because just to be blunt, I need the encouragement. Yeah. And I can listen to Jocko. I can listen to Frank Viscuso and all those. And they do encourage me greatly, especially when Frank's, uh, I think, interviewed about family life, like you said, and Rick, when he talks about his testimony, I get more out of that than I do some guy standing up, beating his chest, talking about, you got to do this and you got to do that. And you got to always yeah. be this way. Well, that's great. But you really didn't tell me anything different than any other leadership quote. Cause if you, like you said, all these podcasts and books, where are they getting those principles from? They're the same principles. Yeah. They just put a different spin on it. You know, some of them are even quoting scripture, but they're not even giving the Bible credit for it. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm like, uh, you know, in college, they call that plagiarism. They're pretty strict about that stuff. I don't think I want to plagiarize God. It might be a yeah. different penalty for it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where we need to remember is where are you and I grounded? Yeah. We are grounded in our faith and our family. And you said in the beginning, it's about passion. Where's passion come from? God gave you that. Mm -hmm. He wants you to do that. And if you don't do what you're passionate about, have you noticed that you become bitter and cynical? If you don't use your gift, you start to feel dark. You said, I don't know if it was respected or appreciated. You feel lost. Is that what you're wired to do? So sometimes just like you say with that guy, I got to move myself into another position so I can use that gift. Sometimes you got to go teach in other places so you can use your gift because your department doesn't let you use that gift. That happens. Like I shared with you, that doesn't mean that's a no, but that all comes from your values. Cause if you don't have values, forget about it. Cause Jeremy, let me ask you this question and then I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> if you and I are pushing down a hallway and we took the same oath and we're very passionate about the job. And we know the limits and we know when to push. Them. And this is one of those times where we got to push it. And you are behind me and I'm in front of you. And you know that I just cheated on my family and left them. My, my choice, not bad service. I just decided I went for some crazy young thing and, you know, for some stupid reason. Do you really going to trust me if I will abandon my spouse and my children who I made the commitment at the altar before God? Are you going to trust me with your life? If I abandon them and when things got hard, I abandoned them. You think I'm going to stay with you when things get hard? No, I'm going to be that same person. When things get hard, I'm probably going to push you out of my way to save myself. Yeah. Remember driven and called. Yeah. I think people need to look at that. You can't, you yeah. can't be two people. You yeah. can try, but it'll tear you apart. Oh yeah. So I think that's what we need to really look at is rather than tearing the entire fire service apart, like we like to do on social media, why don't we start with an honest self-assessment and look at ourselves and say, am I who I really say I am yeah. before I say something about the YouTube video, before I comment about a tactic I don't like, before I say anything about a particular leadership doctrine, do I practice my own doctrine first? Do I take the plank out of my own eye before I try to take the speck out of yours, as the word says? Because yeah. if I'm not, I'm a hypocrite. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's my little mini sermon. <laughs> Let me. Yeah, I'm. I'm really glad that you brought you brought that that comment up. The and you might have to, to reword it again to, for me to get it right. But when you're, when you don't you use the passion that you've been given, the purpose you've been given, you become cynical and, and things like that, because that's literally what made me want to have this conversation. And, and you also brought up earlier uh, Pennington's room on uh, clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And that's, you, you basically said the same thing there. And it, and that really spoke to me personally because that that's a story that I have lived. You know, I I have been given a passion to, uh, if you want to say, lead, uh, create leaders, to just just to do something good. I, I feel like I need to be a part of something bigger than myself. 
And I was kind of given that no, that you just, you can't do that here as far as, you know, locally. Mm -hmm. And that started building resentment and that started building anger and frustration. And so I had to purposefully find other outlets, go outside of my department, find other outlets to put that passion into so that it did not create that. And, and like I said, it, that when you, when you said it that way, it really spoke to me because I was like, I, I completely agree because I have lived that life. And if you, if you do not go with that purpose that you've been given, man, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle because you can't just hide from that. It's, it's there. Agree a hundred percent. I think the devil wants you to, when you're told no, to, to stop, shut down, stop. Yeah. And as my mailman, who I used to call the apostle Paul of the mail service, he would stop <laughs> and talk to me about when I was struggling. I said, David, the devil's been after my whole family this week. He's like, good. I was like, what do you mean? Good. He goes, do you think the devil comes after people who's already on his own team? I said, no. He said he only attacks nope. those who are trying to do what they're called to do. He doesn't go after the complacent, yep. the comfortable, or the lukewarm, right? The good enough. That's not my problem. Oh, my house is good. I don't need to worry about that. Or as a song I heard the other day said, we keep our missions overseas, but we wouldn't cross the street to help somebody in need. Yeah, it's we keep it distant. It's not personal. So when it's your passion, Jeremy, you're meant to do it. Doesn't mean you may be, do it there at that particular spot. You need to find where God called you to do it. At. And like in many people's cases, just like mine, I had to go outside of the area code. You know, and the only reason I did was I fell through the floor, ripped my knee in half, and my wife politely informed me we can't live without you or on 18% disability because I was doing it for free, helping my dad with Project Kill the Flashover. And I almost disabled myself and wasn't able to come back to work. So the only reason I made insight training was to protect my family. And when I was laid up, started typing and reading and said, wow, the rest of the world requires an education to hold a thermal imaging camera. We don't. What's wrong with that? Yeah. So let's correlate that what we're talking about. We're passionate. We want to do stuff. What's our depth of our passion? What's the depth of our education? Jeremy, you, you've got a big family. I got a family. When we have a family, is there a required training to be a dad? Is there a required Not that I know of. <laughs> number of hours to be a husband? No. Don't you think that all the hours they require us to run into burning buildings, that there should be some type of training and education for leaders, whether you're a dad, a mom, you know, uh, running a company, of how to manage people. And, and there's lots of them out there, don't get me wrong. But is there anything that's consistent that shares age old timeless wisdom because people haven't changed, just our circumstances and the, and the environment we're in. I always like to say every fire department I go to is the same problems, just different patch, right? So how, how do we get people to understand that, look, th these problems are not new. You know, uh, Malcolm Muggers says it best. He says, there's no such thing as new news. It's old news happening to new people. So you and I as leaders, as dads, as husbands, are facing the same problems our predecessors faced. Yep. And by the way, someone wrote this down on how to face it and how they survived it. The difference is, though, if you look behind me here and you go up here in this giant shelf, if you can see, there's hundreds of books in here. Does those hundreds of books do any good if they just sit on the shelf or worse yet, we read them and we don't apply or share any of that knowledge. Like what you're talking about, sharing it. I'll become cynical if I can't share it. Uh, maybe I can't share it where I think I'm called to share it. Yeah. What if, what if he's putting us somewhere else so we can grow and get developed outside of it. And then as someone else just told me, he said, for 20 years, I've been doing this outside of my department. All of a sudden, my department realizes that I'm valuable. Yeah. No, I don't think it was a sudden coincidence. I think that was, we, you and I were planted in the field. We grew, we're, we're getting better, we're learning. And now that opportunity presents itself with the right person, the right leadership 
to implement your expertise and your passion when it's time. A guy from NC State calls it a policy window. He basically says, you have a great program. You've got it all figured out. You know how to fix this problem. And the, the managers and the leaders go, nope. They don't give you a valid reason. You get angry. You try different ways. It doesn't work. He says, do not throw your efforts in the trash. He said, take this and put it in your right front desk drawer. And every time you have an idea, pull it out, work on it, and put it back. Yeah. And he said, one day, your, your night piece is going to be sitting there on that chessboard, ready to make that killer move. And when they say, wow, it'd be great if somebody had an answer to the problem, and you go, I have it. Yeah. And it's all laid out. All the loopholes have been eliminated because for years you've been working in the background on something you were called to do. You've been helping XYZ department do it. And all of a sudden they realize, my goodness, this, this member of our department has a valuable piece of information, exp experience and education, and we need to take advantage of that. Yeah. So don't get burnt out just because your department's not using it. Yeah. As you said, <clears throat> find other avenues, you know, Get out there and learn. I have learned more, Jeremy, from outside of my department than I ever did oh, yeah. inside my department. Yeah. And that's not a slam to my department. That's just think about how wide and diverse the world is. Well, I think you're doing it wrong if that's the opposite. Yeah. You know, just just it, it doesn't matter how big your department is. You could be no. on in, uh, FDNY. Sure. You are still a tiny piece of the fire service. <laughs> and if you are only absorbing stuff from inside those walls, look at the percentage of fire service and, and lessons and, and everything else that you're not getting. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And, and something else I, I want to, that kind of just a visual that clicked with me as you're talking there, you talking about you, you were planted kind of outside and, uh, it's almost like a nursery to me. You know, you, you go to a nursery to pick out a tree, you know, those trees, depending on how big they were, they, they've been growing for a long time, probably. And was that the, was the intentions of planting that tree that that's their final destination? Absolutely not. Nope. But, but one day somebody's going to come along that, that is exactly the tree they wanted and and they're going to bring it and it's going to be planted where it was meant to be and that is when that's when everything is right and that's that's just a cool visual that just kind of clicked with me that when you're talking that, that's and that that's tree awesome. once it planted will thrive and be a centerpiece for somebody yep. right and when that tree is planted it will also do something else that is key to our survival and our success that most places don't do that tree will drop seeds and plant other trees that will probably spring up and be moved to other places. Cause those little trees that are going to grow into big ones are not going to grow under into a big tree under this, this giant oak tree in my front yard. Yeah. They'll be choked out. So I've got to take them and move them to where they're called to be. So like you said, in the beginning with that personnel issue, they may need to be moved to a different area, different soil where they can grow and someone can help them. Because you and I can't help everybody. But if we are called to use our gifts, we also have to know the limits of our gifts. You call me today and say, Andy, I'm needing a rope rescue class. I'm like, sorry, I'm not your guy, but I know you're guy. Here you go. Um, yeah. You know, I, if it wasn't for Greg Nicholson, I wouldn't know a thing about ropes and knots. I spent yeah. seven years at Station 2, and that ladder company taught me everything about ladder work. And because this guy is allergic to aluminum and ropes, you know, so – they were phenomenal at it, but they shared their collective wisdom and knowing that it would benefit others. And that's what you are doing when you get outside of your comfort zone, go to other places, whether it's in your volunteer department, in your community, whether you travel and teach, whether you do podcasts, which to me, podcasting and sharing online makes your reach exponential because you don't know who's going to be listening to this. Yeah. yeah. That may say that's what's going on in my life right now. Yep. Yeah. Seriously. Absolutely. They don't know. And you may they may be sitting there with pills on the table or gun on the table or, you know, divorce papers or, you know, quitting the fire department and say, you know what? I need to give this another shot somewhere, another way. Yep. This, these, these are permanent solutions to a problem that's temporary. And I need to figure out a better way of managing this problem because this problem doesn't define me. It hurts. It's painful, but it's not the end of me unless I choose it to be the end of me. So let's, let's,
take that and say, you're passionate for a reason. Don't let your passion turn into poison, basically, because you're not able to use it. And then what if you sit inside that wall with five people, those walls with five people, and you're poisonous, Jeremy, you're going to poison them. And I'm going to poison, I'm going to come in and poison 25 people. Yeah. You know, so what good are we doing if we can't come in and, and be at least somewhat positive and share our passion in a way that encourages them and helps them? Yeah. We've got to figure out a way to plant ourselves in better soil despite our current circumstances, despite what our limitations within our fire department or what the world's doing, what you're doing right now is an example of that. Yeah. You're taking time away to benefit others. And then you're going to go back being the dad and doing all the stuff you do. And people are going to hear that. And they're going to say, well, Jeremy took time and still was able to go spend time with his family. Why can't I take an hour and do that? Why not? Yeah. I think we all need to, like I said, an honest self-assessment of who we are. Are we who we say we are? Are we using our gift appropriately? And how can we use it in a better way to help others? Because whether you like it or not, me and you got to hang up the helmet one day, don't we? Yeah. You want to you want to find something really convicting? Get you a little jar, regular mason jar, and then take one marble for every month you have left on the fire department, and then have another jar if you really want to be convicted. <laughs> take one month for every, or one marble for every month you have left till your kid turns eighteen and leaves the house. No. And every month that that goes by, you have to throw that marble away. It will tell you that time is fleeting. And oh, yeah. As the word tells us, it'll teach us to number our days. And do I want my days to be numbered with bitterness, anger, being cynical and complaining? Like everybody thinks this thing is their therapist. Yeah. The phone, the social media. I, if I don't like it, I'm going to tell the world about it. Well, great. I'm glad everybody has an opinion that you just spread your poison everywhere. How about share something positive? And when you look at that marble and go, this was an entire month, entire op month of opportunities. What did I do with it? Did I do anything positive with it? Or did I spend 30 days complaining and making the world worse? And I think the whole world needs to look at that because we are the most complaining nation in history. We don't get our way. We like to throw a fit. And my opinion needs some of what I got when I was a kid, when I didn't get my way, I got, I got corrected. Real quick. <laughs> oh yeah. I learned my way was not the best way. <laughs> yeah. Man, there's 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 several points that I want to to go into from what you just said. Okay. Uh, I'll just touch on the first one and and we'll move on to the second one because I, I won't, the second one is more important. Uh, you know, we talked about just a little bit ago that uh, if if you're only focused on learning from your department what you're missing outside well flip that coin over and, and it's what you were just touching on if you're only focused on you know teaching or instructing those in your department how many lives and 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 just people you're missing out on by just confining yourself to that you know get out and and stretch those legs get out of your comfort zone tell your story over you know, however, social media, podcast, whatever, whatever it is, write a book. Mm -hmm. But, but it's the same thing, you know, it's just the opposite of what we talked about you, you can help some people and at, in your small circle, which is good, it's good. Mm -hmm. But we are made for so much more there, we, we have such a bigger purpose and, and our story can help so many people, if we just tell it. And so I just wanted to say that, but the, the, the more important one is, is that the whole marble thing, you know, I wish you wouldn't have said the marble thing about the, the well, 18 years, <laughs> because that, place, yeah. <laughs> that it's literally a conversation that, you know, I was at work last night, but just a texting conversation with my wife. Cause like we talked about before we pushed record, uh, we've got seven kids, but uh, two of them have officially moved out. Wow. And it just goes by so fast and it's so easy to feel like a complete failure as a parent. I mean, you know, we are two people that love our kids. We try our best to be good parents, but you, you, you just can't cover it all. And, and, you know, like we're talking about again, before we push record, uh, 
you've got chores to take care of. You've got remodels going on and, and, and it is so easy to just get lost. And I, man, I can't tell you how many nights I've went to bed and thought to myself, you are the worst parent in the world because you continue to find ways to not spend time where it should be. And again, last night after having that conversation with her, I'm just sitting there in the fire truck on the way back from a call thinking, well, I, I sit here and I, I'd work during the day on chores and, and, and home projects and stuff like that. But then the kids get home and do I stop and spend time with them? No, I'm so focused in on getting that project done. I keep going and, and I keep going till dinner time. And yeah, okay. We might stop then and, and kind of, spend some time together then, but there's still several hours of every day that I could have put them as a priority. And yeah. it is a struggle every single day to beat it in my head, to stop and take advantage of that time. Because like you said, and, I, and like I said, I wish you would have brought that up because gosh, it, that would be such a visible reminder of how it's just gone. And so, yeah, but we need that visible reminder. It's like oh, yeah. the bank account, you know, how much money's in there. And if you don't, you're in trouble. Yeah. You're like most of us, it gets a little closer than we want sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, when you're living that far from the edge all the time with just dollars, think about seconds. You know, we, we talk about that at work. You got seconds to do your job, seconds to make a decision. You know, well, you whether you like it or not, spender or saver, you got eighty six thousand four hundred seconds every day. You don't get to save one of them, but you can spend them differently. Like last night, give you an example of how flawed I am. So my mother in law is disabled. We had her her over for her birthday yesterday. We have to set up a ramp and do a lot of different things to get her in the house, and we had a great time. But she couldn't get down the ramp because her legs were bothering her. She uses a walker. So I went hunting. We have a wheelchair in the house. I went hunting for it. By the time I found it and brought it upstairs, they're already halfway down the ramp. And I, I come out the door and what did I say? Well, I guess I did that for nothing. Is that a smart thing to say? No. So my wife helps her get in the van. I help them back out of the driveway. Emma's sitting in the wheelchair. She goes, will you push me in this? I could have said, nope, I'm going to put it away. But we spent 15 minutes outside doing serpentines, doing figure eights and Going up down the ramp at wide open and probably should have had a helmet and knee pads on, but you know, turned turned a a mistake into a moment, right? And it's not about the gifts we give them, it's our time. It's the physical presence, not the presence in a box. So I what I would give you is this is you have a lot of things that you have to divide yourself up into and you don't want to be at the end of the day, all you have is breadcrumbs left to give to your family. So Think about every moment you have, making making it a moment. You know, whether it's reading the readings them, helping them with schoolwork, sitting watching a movie, running around outside, make it a make it a learning moment, a positive moment, a, a corrective moment. But it's a moment that you want to remember and cherish, right? And I'm the world's worst. I don't have ten acres, but this three quarters of an acre here has been kicking my tail for sixteen years because <laughs> it's built in 1951, and it's like every time we open a wall, we find something wrong. Oh yeah. And I'm like, I'm like right now I got, oh, I need to fix this. I need to fix that. Well, when I die, that list will probably still be there. Oh, yeah. Or our joke is when we're 65 and decide to move into a little condo, we're going to hand the keys over to somebody and say, mm -hmm. here's your really nice, fully remodeled home yeah. <laughs> that we're not going to live in anymore exactly. so they can tear it apart and start over. No, yeah. it's all temporary, man. Yeah. As much as I hate to say that, it's all temporary. It's not eternal. But your kids and your wife, those are big investments that's going to go on and outlast us. Your children are going to leave your home and impact others. Those firefighters you help at work are going to leave that station and impact. You said how many of them are taking promotions? Every one of them? Every one of them. Yep. So every awesome. one of them are going to leave you and go and make a difference based on the investment you made in them. Yep. The dividends you will receive is what you see in their changed lives. And then I always like to say, maybe the good Lord will let us stand up in heaven and look around and see the lives we impacted. And hopefully not show us the ones we missed, yep. you know, because that's the thing that haunts me is, did I spend my time wisely or did I waste it? You get one of these, these little phones, do you get the screen time report at the end of the week? Is that not convicting in itself? Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that hurts my feelings because that that is the marbles. 
how many hours of every day that I was answering emails, answering phone calls, check posting things on Facebook. Cause I don't play candy crush and I don't yep. watch TV unless it's to sit with my daughter. So I'm not goofing off on the phone, yep. but I'm using it instead of what building relationships. Yeah. So I think that's what we need to remember is, are we focused on that? Yeah. Cause th those marbles, they're going to be thrown away. And what's left behind is those moments, those decisions, those impacts, those kids, those people. As somebody else taught me, Jeremy, your ceiling, if you're training me, should be my floor. So when I leave, I should start at your highest level. Because otherwise, we're, we're doing a disservice to our family, our fire service, everyone, because we're making them relearn things they shouldn't have. They should have. This already should have been done. So improve it and then make that the new minimum standard. Because if we don't, the minimum standard is always going to get lowered and lower. Oh, yeah. You know, let's make the minimum standard higher every year. Yep. And when we do that, whether it's our faith, our family, the fire department, we'll be better for it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of a thought that I had last night, uh, just trying to to give time to to these guys at the firehouse to study because there's always something going on. I mean, I literally... It feels like the day, the, the harder I try to intentionally put time aside for them to study, the more crap just happens. You know, calls come in, <laughs> errands need to be run, you know, cylinders need to be filled at another state, you know, just, just something. something. And so, you know, I was just thinking to myself, you know, hopefully, hopefully all of them promote. I don't, I don't want them. I don't want any of them to leave. I love the people I'm with right now. I'm loving this new thing we have going on, but I hope for them, they all promote. And if that's the case, I want to tell them that, you know, please take what we have here, the good that we have done, the, the great atmosphere that we have created, this culture, take it where you go and make it better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're talking through what you're, you're talking through family wise, you know, that's exactly what I want to tell my son, my daughter, when they move out, you know, were we the perfect parents? No, but hopefully you learn something from us, take it with you and make it better, be better than me. You know, I hope that anybody I touch and, and reach, I can make better than myself because you know, what, what's the point if not. Amen to that. So. And, and, and the thing that you just said about things getting in the way. So I usually get to work about 6.30 in the morning. My shift starts at eight, but I have to go through emails and you know typical stuff, make sure whoever I'm relieving, I talk to them, they get out of there a decent hour. From 6.30 that morning to 11 o'clock that night, I only had three calls for service and I slept all night. But in that time from 6.30 to 11, I had 42 phone calls, four meetings, two trucks swapped out. I got to work out and I got to talk to my family for 20 whole minutes. And I, I talked to my guys about a failure I had as, as a leader. I said, been here two years. I haven't really done company officers meeting with y'all. I've come and met with y'all individually, but we need to meet as a group because I had this hit me the other day. I email y'all to death. And I said, and I mistakenly shared this with them because I shouldn't have because they, they just slammed me. But I said, <laughs> how would you feel if you only communicated to your wife by five to six emails a day? Of course, you know what half of them said. Well, that'd be great. I'm like, no, it wouldn't. So what I told is the email doesn't re replace a response yeah. and a relationship. And those things that get in the way, as you said it best, though, I think you you set a really good role model by I'm going to put certain things at the end of the day that I can so I can spend more time with them. But that's a personal sacrifice as a leader. Like, I mean, there's certain things I have to have done by 730 or I have to have done before 1800 hours. But that doesn't mean I have to do all that other admin stuff that I could be doing, like you said, personal interaction and investment with them. But the, what's the cost? Yeah. When they go to bed or they're taking a nap, what are you not doing? Yeah. You're not going to bed. You're not taking a nap. You're doing all that admin stuff that they don't have to do. And hopefully they appreciate that and understand that. Yeah. Because that's the part I think a lot of them don't see is they come in, they do their job to check the trucks out, and then they have their downtime. You don't have downtime, do you? And then when you get home, do you have downtime? No. Yeah. So when do you, as a dad, as a husband, as a firefighter, 
get a moment to go, or as my Apple watch that my wife just got me says, breathe, breathe. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when do you do that? (laughs) I'm always my personal meditation time. I now have seven breaths. That's my, that's my moment. Oh boy. Seven whole breaths for me. (laughs) I'm being selfish. I can't, I hit dismiss. No, I can't. Breathe. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never done it. I, I, <laughs> I think it's always been dismissed. I don't even know why I have it on. Well, trust but, me. Uh, I started doing yeah. it. Dina have you? got me on I, the meditation and mindfulness stuff. And it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, what's your, uh, again, what you're speaking of goes back again. You know, I, I've went back several times to this, these, these projects we're working on behind the scenes uh, you're you're talking about relationships and something that that really it almost hurts me to to hear and to see is the the mindset of when you become an officer when you promote you have to start separating yourself you have to be away from the the people you're working for so that you can be the boss and I hate that I just hate it because to me it, I, I almost feel like it's more important for me to have relationships with those people because you know, I am responsible for, for everything. I'm responsible for, like you've touched on, for, for their mental health, for just, just to be happy. I want to create an environment that I love coming to and that my people love coming to. I can't do that if I don't know who the heck they are, if they don't know who the heck I am. And so that's another piece of this, these, this project is teaching people that you can have relationships with your people and still be the boss. You know, and in fact, I believe, and you can talk, you know, kind of give me your opinion. I believe that the, the greater the relationships are that you build, the, the more respect that you build, the more trust you build, the less I have to be a boss. And that's, that's, I don't want to go to work to be a boss. I want to go to work to, to do good, to help Preach. people and to have fun. And go so tell me, tell me what you think about. Now I'm going to let you keep talking. I'm sitting back here clapping. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Preach on it. Cause it, the thing is, man, uh, a man who just passed away, who's a very famous author, counselor, brilliant man. Dr. Larry Crabb said in his book, the Papa prayer, the power of petition is based on the depth of one's relationship. In other words, people will do more for you because of the strength of that relationship. Think about how strong your relationship w- is with your wife. If she came to you today and said, Jeremy, I need you to do something. And it's very hard. It's going to be costly. It's going to cost a lot of time. Would you do it? Absolutely. Because you have a strong, deep relationship. This whole buddy boss line thing that everybody likes to throw out there. There's a part of it I understand. That, yep. that is that it has to be there where you end up being the boss when you're forced into it. Yep. All right. I get that. But I think a lot of that is pushed on administrators so that there is a separation so that when, when it is pushed down for you to make them do something that you are disconnected. And when you're disconnected from your people, you'll drop the hammer on them and not care. And I think that's one of the reasons I probably get in a lot of trouble is I stay connected to my people. And when they push something down that I know is not hundred percent correct, I don't be disrespectful to the command staff. I, I research it. I make sure it's, you know, it's as fair and equitable as our policy says. And if it's what it says it is, I, I administer it. If it's not, then I basically back my people and say, look, this is what is being done. This is where there's something that needs to be addressed. I don't make a public spectacle of it, but buddy and boss line really can be a way of saying, you know, we don't want you to be too connected to your people because in the end, we want you to tote the company line hundred percent. Well, the company line, Jeremy is for the citizen. It's the mission you swore to do. And if your mission visions and value statement says that you should follow policy implicitly without ever having any critical thinking skills, then you've got robots yeah. and you don't yeah. have people. And you have to be careful about uh, sending out emails and, and policies every week, changing something because we keep figuring things out differently and expecting them to suddenly change their behaviors and then discipline them when they don't do it right. Because yeah. we're not even following. You've got to know your people. You've got to know them, care for them, know their kids, 
know their their wives, know their spouses, what they're doing. Because one of the things we used to do that I used to love when I was at Station 2 was we would do roll call every morning and we'd go over what we had to do for the day. But the first question we asked, first question was, how was your day off? Why should you do that? Because if they've had a terrible day off, something bad happened, something's going on with their family, do you think that's going to affect their overall performance while they're at work with you? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So why aren't more leaders concerned about you go on a trip with your family and all your kids are getting in that car? I bet you check the oil, check the tires, you know, make sure everything's packed. You don't just jump in the car and hit hit go on Siri and take off. You better make sure that your people who are going to staff that fire truck are good physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that they're OK. Because if they're not thinking clear and you put them in a stressful situation, the chances for error, mistakes, or worse is very, very high. So that whole buddy boss line stuff, I don't buy into it at 100%. Sorry. You know, you can preach it in leadership books all you want. If you make me be your boss, sure. You know, you violate something that's what what they call felonious stupidity. You made a, you made a mistake that me and the best lawyer can't get you out of and you didn't come to me beforehand, one of my friends always said, don't do anything to get yourself fired. And if you do call me first, you know, uh, I appreciated that because he got, had a heads up and tried to, you know, help you out. Yeah. But you can't defend them when they've already went side out. Dad says, if you go outside the system, system's going to eat you. Yeah. You're in the general statute clause at that point, yeah. not in the policy. You're, you're dealing with litigation and law and all that, but you need to know, your best firefighter on the truck is not just your best firefighter because he or she is skilled at X, Y, Z stuff is who they are inside. You need to know, like my rookie um, engine two, when I was over there built houses since he was 16, who do you think I should te- let teach building construction? Me who can't build a bird house. No, the rookie, yeah. because he understands framing. He understands foundations. He understands all the things I did. So to quote, to, to add to your point, you can't lead your people if you don't know them and their overall level of commitment to you will be based on how much you care for them. Yep. Bottom line, you can quote all the leadership doctrine you want. If you don't care about your people, they're not going to follow you. They'll respect you because they have to. And some of them probably, some of them closer to retirement won't. But, you know, they, they will buy in 100% if you're the one that shows up for their family, sends flowers to them when bad things happen, helps them with hard situations, guides them, talks to them, cares about them, they're going to back you. They're going to buy in and they're going to go that extra mile for you. You'll never have to be, to quote you, the boss. You're just an orchestra conductor waving your hands while they're really doing all the beautiful work that makes the music. Make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you and I don't know who who I heard this from, and it, it might be passed on so much that nobody knows, and you, and you kind of said part of it, but something I, I've heard here lately is, you know, I can be your buddy, I can be your boss, I can be both together, mm-hmm. but if you make me pick one of them, I'm going to have to be your boss, and that's the end of the story. Mm-hmm. But what I want to add to that is is preloading that, you know, the 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 preemptive strike of that is, is I'm going to spend time before all that happens, building respect with you, building relationship with you, building the, the foundation that is going to be there to prevent that, that, uh, that from happening. Absolutely. And so th- I think that's kind of the, the place we need to focus on, you know, keeping, keeping that choice from, from never even having to be made. And so that, I, and, and again, uh, what you're talking about, you t- taking care of your people, you mentioned, you know, my, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, the crew first culture, the name I basically, the message mm-hmm. I try to share that that's exactly it. That's why I picked that name. Mm-hmm. And that's what, you know, people ask me what it means. That's exactly what I'll tell them. I feel like if I take care of my people, mm-hmm. I treat them right. I I back them up when they need to be backed up and they know it. I respect them. You know, all that. I know that if I do that, 
they will do everything they can to accomplish whatever task is put in front of them and, and not it just just to make me look good. That's it. You know, if at the bottom line, they're going to do it just to make me look good because of all that. And and I don't know why that's so hard to understand. And it's so hard for me. It it almost hurts me when I feel like I'm not getting that from my bosses. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're so passionate about something like that and then you're not feeling it in return, it's like, gosh, it, I just want to be valued. I just want to be supported. That's it. Jeremy, you said something that's really powerful and it, it goes back to Ephesians 531 it says that every man shall love his wife and every wife shall respect her husband. And a man who wrote a book after doing 30 years of marital counseling realized he was doing it wrong. His name was Dr. Emerson Egrich. He wrote that book. Oh, yeah. And yep. he said, only after 30 years did I realize if I don't love my wife the way that she deserves to be loved, then she will withhold what from me? Respect. Every man is wired for that, to have to be respected and appreciated. And every woman is wired to receive love. And if they don't get what they're wired for, then they will withhold what you and I need. And when you and I don't get what we want, so to speak, or need to be affirmed, we seek it out in other ways. So when you say, I don't understand why people behave, they do, they're not receiving what they need to be affirmed and appreciated. So they're seeking it out in different ways. And then some people who are toxic leaders who are only about themselves don't understand or don't want to open up and care for more than their own needs. It may appear that they do, yeah. but you know, to care for everyone takes a heart that has the one who died for everyone in it in my belief. Yeah. Jesus doesn't reside in here. There is no way I can truly care for you, your family and everyone else in the way that I should truly care for you. I can say I care and I can give you nice words and I can do nice things, but I'm not going to show that level of commitment. That means personal sacrifice, like what you're doing for your guys and your gals, your wife, your kids, because the world thinks that's crazy for you to go above and beyond and do big sacrificial acts of servanthood and love for people. They don't understand that. Yeah. Certain leaders don't understand that because their version of leadership is textbook. Yeah. It's from this leadership school. It's from this book. And it's this deep. Yeah. And remember what I said, what Dr. Larry Crabb said, the power of petitions based on the depth of relationship, that leadership is based on how deep their passion, dedication, and love for not just the profession, but the people who make that profession great. If they don't love and care for their people, it's all about a title and they're a five-year chief here, five-year chief here, and they're just putting little things on their resume. That's all they're doing. looks good, but in the end, you can have a certificate that says you're married, but doesn't mean you have a good marriage. You can have a certificate that says you're a firefighter, doesn't mean you're a good one. When I went to thermography school, they said, you are now certified. You are not qualified. Qualification rests with your company. And I thought, well, how brilliant is that? How many <laughs> certified professionals do we know that are really not qualified? Yeah. Think about that. So if you want to know the difference between a boss who cares and a boss who's just a boss, look at what's inside their heart and what their lives and how they treat people on and off duty. Because that's who they are. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the people I want to work for, the ones that go above and beyond that, yeah, every now and then they may break a rule to help somebody. Yeah, they might do it. But in the end, they're going to do what's right for everybody. Yeah, They're not going to do what's wrong just to protect their position. Yeah. If, if, as I always like to say, your principles are often only as deep as your paycheck. And if your paycheck drives you, Stay away from them because we get paid to do our job. But in the end, I started doing it for free because I loved it. And I just decided that if I can do this for a profession and get paid for it, why not? That's a double whammy, (laughs) right? So why go to work and be miserable, right? So to me, it was a double, double double-edged sword of I win, I win, not, you know, I'm just doing this for money. 
Because yeah. you're not going to make a million dollars as a firefighter. Who thinks you're going to be rich being a firefighter? Nobody. But, you, but your leadership individuals should be based on their level of personal commitment to the people, not necessarily the profession. And that's tough to find in this world today because more people are more scared of all the consequences of whether it's political correctness, whether it's don't talk about your faith, don't talk about this, don't talk. They want you to talk about everything else but who you are and what what means something to you. But but yet, what what's on our what's on our patch, Jeremy? What's uh this right here? Let me pull this off here. This patch is what? A Maltese what? Cross. Huh. But we're not <laughs> we're not supposed to talk about faith. The Maltese cross has eight points. Eight points come from what? Eight be beatitudes on Sermon on the Mount. From who? Jesus. Well, what was the original purpose of the Maltese cross? The Knights of St. John sacrificed themselves, saved their own when they poured naphtha on their brothers and sisters, the Knights, and pulled them down while they were on fire. Great personal sacrifice. They went through the fire to save each other, and they were given a cross to carry. St. Francis of Assisi said, in all things, go and preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. So when they tell you you can't talk about your faith, fine. Just watch my watch my works. Yeah. Watch your works. Watch how you treat your wife and your kids. I think A.W. Tozer said it best, too. If I want to know what kind of Christian a man is, I'll go talk to his wife first. Because that's how I'm going to find out who he really is. So look for those leaders. And as you said in the beginning, you want that crew first culture with that shared set of values. Surround yourself with those values. And you will always, always grow. You put a toxic one in there. It's like going out in my garden right now. I got a lot of weeding to do. <laughs> you're going to find you're going to do more weeding than you are growth. So my best to all those who are struggling with this because it is a common problem because no matter what organization you work for, they have the same people in them. Yep. Right? Oh, yeah. Our job is to influence them. So it's something that is kind of kind of been apparent to me here lately is, you know, I, I can be a, a, a good station officer by training my people. I can, I can make them better. I can make them, you know, better firefighters, better drivers. I can make a good culture and be a good station officer. But what I'm realizing is I can take it to the next level and, and bring some parenting and, and I can create better people. I can teach them how to become better humans. And that's, that's the leader I want to be. Yeah. Do I want to make them better firefighters? Absolutely. Do I want to have a solid crew that knows what they're doing? Dang right. I do. Yeah. Do I want to have a group of people that know how to live, know how to enjoy life, know how to take care of their family? All That's what I want. That is that next level. And, and so that's something I've really started thinking about here lately. And that's the way it should be. I've heard people say they take competence over character. And I told them, no, I could train, train somebody for competence. I, I can't train them to care. Yeah. You could be the best forceful entry guy in the world, but if you don't care about people, why do I want you in a profession that means you have to care? Because at three in the morning, when they have toe pain and you have to pick them up off the floor, you better care or you're going to not have a really good attitude. Right. Oh yeah. You've got to have a heart for people. And, and that empathy and all that stuff we talked about comes back to caring and values. And if they're burnt out, maybe they need to go move and get reset. You know, we yeah. all get that way. But the, f the fact that you're training people to be better people, then they'll be better firefighters is the key. Yeah. And I, and I think that's what's missing. It's, it's too much task books, skill based, do this X, Y, Z, you're good. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah, you, know, you may you may be able to pull that hose line and deploy it beautifully, but do you know why you're flowing water the way you do, where you're going, and did you know you just passed a kid's room? Did you even care that you washed out in the front yard their only pair of shoes when you said it was for them? You know, you're worried about water damage. You only flowed 30, 60 seconds during fire attack and you dumped 1,500 gallons in overhaul and threw all their stuff in the front yard like it was garbage and they're standing out there with no rental insurance. Yeah. That comes with caring and understanding. And if, if they don't care, 
and they're saying it's for them, it's all about the T-shirt. Okay. Like you said, we want to go there. We enjoy doing that. But you got to remember who you're doing it for. I don't want nobody's house to burn. But if it does, I want to be there and make a difference and try to minimize that impact to that family and the their property and all that. No. But I got to care more about them than I do about my time on the nozzle. Yeah. That that kind of hurts because <laughs> whether we admit it or not, we're a bit selfish on that, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think you're spot on, man. I, I applaud what you're doing. I, I think you need to to carbon copy yourself and and do what you're doing and make more people like you and uh, help the guys in your station as much as you can. And a good sign of good leaders, people who are constantly getting promoted out of his station, not getting transferred, not, not necessarily retiring, but get promoted. That means yeah. they're learning, they're growing, they're moving because good people don't stay in one place. They don't, yeah. they grow. And they're in that nursery, like you said, and they're moved to another place. So kudos to you. Keep up the good work. I think you're, you're on it. Appreciate it. I, man, I've, I've really, really enjoyed this. I don't, I don't want to stop, but I know we both have big to-do lists and, and I, I want to respect your time as much as I better get going on with mine. But uh, before we wrap it up, is, is there anything you want to add? Anything you didn't get to talk about or whatever? Well, like I said, we could talk all day, but you know, <laughs> the purpose of our call was to encourage people. And I just want them to know, that I've been in several dark places in my career. And if, if you want to know the exact moments, they happen throughout the year. Sometimes I've, I've come home and told my wife, I'm done. I ain't putting up with this no more. And then she has to hear me say the same things and bring me back to set, reset me back to, Hey, you, you got to hold the line here. You got three more years. You got to, you know, but we all feel those feelings and they're okay to feel them. What's not okay is to poison everybody with those feelings and to infect others and attack your own organization and destroy it so that it doesn't get better. If you want to fix the fire service, start with yourself and the people around you. Don't blame the command staff, even though there might be stuff that that's going on, but you know what? I'm not sitting in their shoes. And when I sat in the back of the fire truck, I used to know when I got, yeah, boy, he doesn't know what he's doing. When I sit in the cabin seat, I'm going to run things differently. And I sat in the front seat and I'm like, mm, not what I thought it was. <laughs> It was a lot tougher. I think I'd rather pull the line than tell them how to pull the line. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stress with that. Yeah. And when, especially when you become a dad and, and have kids, cause you think about their kids. So if you're in a dark spot, here's the, here's the deal. If you have a present, and I told this to my daughter last night, a gift inside the box is dark. Could be the most gi- amazing gift in the world, but it's in darkness. And the gift is not valued, treasured, even appreciated until it's opened and brought into what the light open your your box your gift and share it with people who are negative who are hurting who are cynical and even as you said in the beginning i don't know if it made a difference we may not know yeah. but our purpose is not to receive a check box an incentive check or an admiration statement saying yes you made a difference no my purpose is to share yeah. and share that gift and hope and pray that it made a difference. And we won't get a QA report saying you made a difference this year, this, this, and this, not on this side of the earth. It's only when we get up to heaven, where we'll get that report and say, hopefully we'll hear these words, Jeremy. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the best performance review you'll ever receive. So don't give up. Don't stay in the box, get out in the light and get other people like Jeremy and others who will encourage you, affirm you, lift you up, and yes, hold you accountable. You know, that's important. And keep you on that path so that your gift will be used and you won't become cynical. Because somebody who's been there and I fall in that trap, you may fall in a ditch, but your purpose is not to stay in the ditch. Okay? Get out of there. It's okay to feel down. It's not okay to stay down. So don't let the world take your joy from you because they don't steal it. You give it to them. You have a choice to make, make the choice to go make a difference and do that each and every day, especially when you don't feel like it. <laughs> Cause that's the day you're probably gonna make the biggest difference when you go, oh, I just don't want to do it today. So thank you for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. 
You're welcome. How can anybody get a hold of you out there that, that wants to to hear more from you? I, I know you got your your Facebook group as well that we didn't talk about. So Sorry. to just tell them where to go to find you and, and contact you. Well, we have two things we do. We do fire. We do thermal imaging training. And then I have a ministry page. Our ministry page is bringing back brotherhood on Facebook. Uh, we post firefighter based devotionals and parables on it every couple of days we were blessed to reach over a million views last year so i'm very thankful for that um as far as the professional side of things you can reach me through my phone number 704-507-7156 please don't call after 10 o'clock i'll get in trouble <laughs> um uh, the other thing is our emails andy starns at instructor andy starns.com you can also check out our website uh, insight training llc.com which is currently being remodeled had numerous issues with that so we're fixing that uh we're on facebook as you said uh instructor and andy starns we've got a private thermal imaging group called tactical thermal imaging you can join you have to answer two questions to prove you're not a robot uh, we don't allow any garbage any politics no what we ate for dinner on there it's just all about thermal imaging there's several files over a thousand discussions uh, we have uh, our twitter account we have our train our at training insight on instagram Twitter accounts, two different accounts, uh, at Insight TRN or at KTF Burns DC. Uh, then we have numerous other partners, uh, Max Firebox, my good friend, Sean Blanker, who been with a long time, the fight and the good fight, sharing this information. We do a ton of stuff with him and we, we are blessed to travel a lot of places and hopefully as restrictions are easing up, we got a good looking summer and fall coming up. And uh, hopefully uh, we, if you see a 21 foot black van that says, insight training on it it'll have me and my family in it because that's why we bought it so our goal is to get out and see the world together so we hope we get to see you if you have questions about faith family fire department thermal imaging all the above just know that we'll be glad to answer your question and you can email us to talk to us we're, we're people we're not anything special we're just here to help everybody else make a difference and our motto is to become intelligently aggressive we want to know why we're doing what we're doing and do it better. And that's our goal. So hopefully we can do that in every aspect, like Jeremy and I talked about today, from who we are at home, who we are at work and making a difference. So thanks for the opportunity again. I appreciate it. No, no problem. I, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to to more discussions with you because this is this has been great. It really has been great. And I am excited to put it out. So thank you. I appreciate your time and and look forward to to much more. So Thanks, I bro. appreciate it. Thank you.